the pride of Africa, a lioness, the top predator of the African plains. She's also a mother. Her cubs and the rest of the pride depend on her for food and survival. We call her Kali. Unlike leopards and cheetahs, lions are social animals. They live in prides composed of a few females, their cubs, and one or two males. The females are the hunters. The males defend the territory. But even for the king of beasts, life on the African plains is one challenge after another. Filmmaker Simon King followed our lioness over a period of nine months to capture this intimate portrait of Kali, the lion. Nature is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you, your gas company and America's natural gas industry, who have developed ways to run buses, cars, and trucks on clean natural gas in order to reduce pollution and help preserve the environment. Siemens, a whole new world of ideas in electronics and electrical engineering. Siemens, precision thinking and by Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. Kali's failure is not unusual, but it is serious. It's the dry season, and the great herds have followed the rain south. Large prey are scarce now. The zebra were a godsend, but without the advantage of surprise, Kali has no chance against their speed. These are lean times for her pride. Seven adult females, cousins, sisters, mothers, and daughters, raise their cubs under the protection of a single mature male, Kichwa. It's difficult for a single male to hold a pride. Until recently, Kichwa had a partner, 
a strong male in his prime. When he was killed in a border dispute, Quechua was left to defend the territory and the pride alone. And now his health is failing. A year ago, he was cut badly by a poacher's snare. The wound has never really healed, making him susceptible to parasites. Bundu, the pride's oldest female, has lived through the tenures of several males. If possible, females remain in their prides for life. Males may come and go, but they are essential. Only they can protect the cubs from nomadic males who would kill them if they got a chance. There are 12 cubs now of various ages. The youngest are Kali's own. Born blind, deaf, and weighing only three pounds, they spent the first six weeks in a den with their mother. She's only recently introduced them to the pride. Since pride females are closely related, they willingly suckle each other's cubs. The Musiara Marsh is the heart of the pride's territory. It is part of Kenya's Masai Mara Game Reserve the northern tongue of the Serengeti Plain. As far back as human memory reaches, lions have lived here. The water bubbles up from underground springs. As the dry season progresses, it becomes an increasingly vital oasis. Yellow-billed storks and kingfishers ply its waters. The permanent water attracts all kinds of thirsty beasts, but at this time of year, few are suitable prey for lions. Elephants stay close to the marsh, but they're too big to be considered lunch for even the biggest of cooperative hunters. Lions are the only social cats. By hunting together, they're the only predator able to tackle prey weighing more than 500 pounds. If elephants are too big, warthogs are too small to go far in feeding the pride. But at this time of year, with little else to choose from, they become a staple. New litters of piglets appear and are too tempting to be ignored. Others from the pride join the chase. Kali's success leaves her hunting partners envious. She carries her prize well above the reach of her own hungry cubs. She will feed herself first. She must stay healthy if she's to raise this litter or the next. The piglet will only take the edge off her hunger. She hurries to the cool seclusion of the forest to eat in peace. But she's discovered by a half-grown male cub playing in a tree. The 
smell of meat is irresistible to him. Surprisingly, Kali surrenders her kill to the male cub without a protest. Perhaps it's his air of bold self-assurance. Kali's cubs have followed her into the forest hoping for some scraps, but they dare not tackle the older cub. Lions do not share willingly. Tired and famished, the smaller cubs can only watch. They will not eat today. The rains are still months away. With the Mara Plains empty of prey, lean times test the limits of the lion's strength, as individuals and as a pride. Cooperative hunting is worthwhile only when large prey are available. The African buffalo certainly fits the bill. A bull weighs nearly a ton, a feast for the whole pride, but at the upper limit of what they can handle. The marsh is a magnet for buffalo in the dry season, and each year the pride turns to this formidable challenge, perhaps the most dangerous animal in Africa. Many lions have been gored by those wicked horns, but hunger emboldens Kali and the pride. A small bachelor herd may provide a target. Lion's only chance is to separate one of the bulls from the others. The herd runs into the forest, hoping to lose their pursuers. But one makes a wrong turn. He's lost the others. He is found only too soon. The lions are wary. If they attack from the front, they could be gored. The buffalo falls, stumbling under their weight, but his hide is very thick and the lions can't get a good grip. The bull may be down, but he's not seriously hurt. To kill him, a lion must get a hold on his throat and hang on until he suffocates. But that means coming within range of those lethal horns. A deadly stalemate. Neither side can afford to back down. The buffalo roars, calling his companions to his defense. The buffalo will bear the scars of this attack, but has suffered no permanent harm. The lions, too, have their share of superficial wounds. 
But the real injury they must bear is the depletion of their energy reserves, and with nothing to show for it. They return to the cubs and lick their wounds. Resigned to another day of involuntary fasting, they settle down together to sleep. The Musiara Marsh weaves its own dream through the long, still afternoons. But hunger does not rest, and sooner or later the lions must venture into the marsh again. Like most cats, lions have no love of water. Strength and grace define the lion, but not always. Another four days pass, and still nothing to eat. Now they spend nearly all their time sleeping. Next morning, as the pride moves to the shade to escape the gathering heat, Bundu stiffens to attention. Does she see food or danger? It's both. A cow buffalo has wandered from the security of her herd, an unusual and unwise thing to do. Kali is the first to move. Realizing there's only one lion, the buffalo turns to defend herself. her body. With the rear of the buffalo held firm, Kali clamps onto the muzzle. Her mouth just covers the cow's mouth and nose, sealing out air in a literal kiss of death. Life ebbs from the buffalo, Kali continues her fatal embrace. Her cubs have heard the uproar.
Exhausted but victorious, Kali calls them to the feast. It will be their first real meal in a week. Strength, not need, determines who eats first. The adults shoulder the younger lions away from the choicer bits. They live a life of feast and famine, bolting down 40 pounds at a sitting. Only when kills are large enough to satisfy all the adults will the cubs be allowed to eat. Many die of starvation at this time of year. Kali buries the entrails. The pride will stay close to the kill tonight to protect it from hyenas. Dawn finds the youngest members of the Pride burning off some of their newfound energy in play. Chasing and pouncing are favorite games. Good practice for hunting later on. Pungent odors attract them. They actually enjoy a good role in elephant dung. The feast lasts for two days. Fully gorged, they fall into the deep sleep of the contented. They nestle together, finding comfort in the physical contact. Kichwa was patrolling his territory and came late to the kill. But he's well fed now and acts the good-natured and tolerant father. Of all the animals on the African plains, only elephants would presume to disturb such blissful sleep. They don't like the lion so close to their young, and their size and strength allows them to enforce their wishes.
One cub sleeps on, too far gone to notice it has company. The days pass in a haze of sleep. It's been more than a week since the buffalo kill. The younger cubs are now desperately hungry again, and they need to eat more often if they're to put on weight. But the cubs must wait until the adult lionesses become hungry themselves. Only then do they stir into action again. The dry plains still offer little in the way of prey. Warthogs seem to be the only option. One of Kali's sisters takes up a position behind the family of warthogs. Kali now moves forward, circling wide to get in front of the warthogs so she can drive the prey toward her sister. Ambush is ready, the trap is sprung. usually dominate the females of a pride, and if Kichwa wasn't weakened by injuries, parasites, and disease, he would have seized this kill for himself. As it is, he must wait until the lionesses have fed. Each individual must fight for their place at the kill. Only the strong and bold will survive. Black kites circle the kill. Their shadows startle Kali's famished cubs, who must wait while the others feed and hope for scraps, like the kites. Tempers flare, competition is fierce. Every morsel is jealously guarded. Kali even seems to resent the presence of the kites enough to try to do something about it.
When kills are so small and the pride so large, nothing is left for the young. The hip bones of Kali's cubs jut out of their shrunken flanks. Kali, too, has not had enough to eat and has gone hunting again. The pride rushes to welcome her back, but she has nothing to show for her effort. Without more and larger prey, the pride may break into splinter groups. One of Kali's cubs had followed on her last abortive attempt. It was left behind in the confusion of the hunt, and Kali hasn't missed him yet. Tired, weak, and footsore, he searches for the pride. As night falls, Kali finally realizes her cub is missing and calls for him. The cub is too far away to hear. Alone and starving, he faces a long and dangerous night ahead. The next morning, Kichwa and the Pride come to investigate what the vultures have found. They know that where these birds gather, there may be some carrion worth eating. Lions are avid scavengers, too. There's not much left, and the scent is disturbing. What does remain is enough to tell Kali that her cub is gone. Eight out of ten lion cubs may die before they're two years old. All these cubs are now painfully thin. Before this dry season ends, four more will die, including Kali's last. But even more profound changes will shake the pride. The ailing Kichwa will die, and a pride without a master invites the attention and aggression of strange males. The marsh pride's future is in doubt. The spring rains come and go, leaving the promise of new grass in their wake. By the end of July, the great herds of wildebeest and zebra make their way back to the Maasai Mara and its Musiara Marsh. Suddenly, the empty grasslands are crowded with animals that are ideal prey for the lions. In the confusion of the great herds, young animals often get separated from their mothers. Once that happens, their fate is sealed. It's Bundu, the old lady, whose long years of experience help her to feed and protect the youngsters who are left. But Kali is not at the kill. She came into heat soon after the last of her cubs died, and with no male in attendance, left to find a mate. The seven remaining cubs still can't hunt for themselves, but with the lean times behind them, they will survive. 
thanks to Bundu. Over the centuries, the Maasai people and the lions have built up a healthy respect for each other. The Maasai graze their cattle on the plains north of the reserve. The lions rarely attack them while the tribesmen are present. It's the Maasai who are largely responsible for the abundance of new grass. They burn off the invading scrub and tall grass to make way for new tender shoots for their cattle and in turn provide lusher pasture for the wild grazers. It's good news for the birds, too. They follow the fires, catching insects as they try to escape the flames. And it's certainly good news for the prey animals. They're safer here. There's no long grass for lions to hide in. If a lion is spotted at a distance, there's no chance it will outrun its prey. Without cover to conceal it, until it's close enough to charge, the lion is at a disadvantage. Kali has an added disadvantage. She's pregnant. While wandering, she met and mated with a male from a neighboring pride. Now she lives alone. She would not be welcomed by the lionesses of her mate's group. Neither can she return to her old pride, because new males will take it over someday, and they would kill any cubs that they had not fathered themselves. So she lives alone and hunts alone, weighed down by her unborn young. She sees a male impala make a mistake he wanders into longer grass. But Kali is in the open. She knows that when the impala's head is down grazing, she can move forward without being seen. When the impala's head is raised, she freezes. Male impalas defend breeding territories and resist leaving even when they suspect danger. suffocating stranglehold is applied to the throat. Such a substantial meal will last Kali several days. Living outside of a pride is unusual for a lioness, but it's part of the normal life cycle for males. Old enough to be independent, but not yet old enough to fight for prides of their own, they roam widely. These brothers are now three years old, and their manes are just beginning to show. When they're fully grown, they will join forces to drive out the old males of some pride. Now, they wander the region, boisterous and healthy, careful to steer wide of the resident males.
Their wanderings bring them to a very pregnant Kali. She's not very happy about having these high-spirited and powerful adolescents around when she's so close to giving birth. But this trio of young rakes grew up in the marsh pride. Since Kali has known them all their lives, they all eventually settle down together for a nap. Hopefully these poor relations will get bored and leave. It's hard enough feeding herself. She's certainly not prepared to provide for them. When the heat breaks that evening, Kali will leave to prepare an ambush at a nearby water hole. As the herds gather there for a drink, she will kill a wildebeest. After eating her fill, she retired to sleep it off. Next morning, one of the young males spots the vultures. His excitement grows as he lopes toward them and finds Kali's unfinished meal. Kali awoke with a renewed appetite. She returns to the carcass, only to find the young male dragging her food away. Wisely, she decides to leave the thief with his plunder. A young male just coming into his strength would be a lot for a lioness to handle, and his brothers are probably not far away. As pregnant as she is, she can't afford to take risks. Alone, with no pride and no territory, the odds are against her and her unborn cubs. On a leisurely visit to the outlying parts of their territory, two males from the neighboring Bilashaka pride meet and greet each other with great affection. They're young and fit at the height of their powers. They range farther than the females of their pride, always on the lookout for trespassers. They've caught Kali's scent. She's sound asleep, but definitely on their turf. Kali wakes to the sound of their heavy padding. But she's not alarmed. One of these magnificent cats sired her cubs. They check her scent. The exaggerated snarl helps heighten his sense of smell. It exposes an organ in the upper palate that tells him whether Kali is in estrus or not. But Kali is not in heat and she doesn't have a kill that they can steal. They do recognize each other, though, and decide to rest together. When they get hungry, the males will leave to find their own pride and help themselves to one of their lioness's kills.
On her own again, Kali is now so heavy that she tires very quickly. The zebra can tell from her demeanor that she has no designs on them now. She would prefer something easier. She flushes an ostrich, which could easily outrun Kali. But the ostrich hesitates, concerned about her nest. The great bird zigzags away from the nest, hoping to confuse Kali about its location. But her performance is to no avail. Kali's found the nest all right, but she has no idea what to do with those huge eggs. Small feathers tickle her nose, and big ones get stuck to her mouth. It's all very annoying and does nothing to stem her appetite. The eggs are safe. The herds have congregated on the short grass. Without cover, Kali just can't get close enough to catch them by surprise. There are other predators much better adapted to these wide open plains. The cheetah is a specialist of the short grass plains. It has the speed and endurance to chase down its prey over longer distances than the lion, which must depend on an explosive burst of speed and power. Kali is now 100 days into her pregnancy and could give birth at any time. She's awkward and uncomfortable. Hunting alone, her success rate is half what it would be if she had partners, if she had a pride. Only one in every 12 attempts will end with a meal. This is the time when the topi bear their young, so they're especially careful to stay in the short grass where mothers can keep an eye out for predators. Kali must eat now to carry herself through the birth. Finding a newborn topi, still a little unsure on its legs, is a stroke of luck. The death of a newborn in exchange for the life of Kali's unborn.
Kali's roars reverberate through the morning mist, announcing her presence. The males from the Vilashaka pride recognize Kali's calls and decide to investigate. From her vantage point on an old termite mound, Kali sees lions approaching and realizes too late that she may have made a fatal mistake. The entire Bilashaka pride has come in answer to her calls and they seem anything but neighborly. Strange females are often attacked by female pride members who will drive outsiders from their territory. The dominant lioness rushes forward to challenge Kali, but as she draws closer, her expression changes. She seems to recognize Kali's scent. Perhaps she too grew up in the marsh pride and knew Kali when she was young. In the Mara, where pride splinter and grow according to the abundance of prey, members of adjacent groups are often related. These seemingly playful challenges are actually tests of Kali's strength and courage. If she shows weakness, this romp could easily turn into a rout. But Kali is accepted into the Bilashaka pride. Storms tumble round the hills. The short rains of autumn refresh the expectant African plains. Kali's new pride takes shelter in the dense scrub, where the youngsters have found a new plaything. Hidden under the tangle of tawny bodies is the center of their attention one of Kali's newborn cubs. She has just introduced it to the pride. Hearing its distress calls, Kali decides to put an end to their game. As members of a pride, her tiny cubs have a much better chance of surviving their kittenhood. The two strong males will protect them, and the other females will help feed them until they can fend for themselves. Despite appearances, a lion's life is never an easy one. Even with the help and security of their strong pride, these cubs will have to be lucky to live long enough to have families of their own. But they may have inherited their mother's luck. Only luck has brought this chapter of Kali's story to such a happy ending. Nature is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Siemens, a whole new world of ideas in electronics and electrical engineering. Siemens, precision thinking. And by Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. And by the gas industry, helping provide cleaner air with clean gas energy.
This is PBS.